And we're live. Welcome to Fun Friday. This is our second week of the show Quarantine. We're excited to be here and we have some fun things to share with you today. Math Dad is going to do Venn diagrams. I prepared a lesson about having a career as a YouTuber and we're going to take you sort of behind the scenes of what we do because I know that's becoming a more and more popular career choice for, for kids. And then we're all, we also have a fun engineering challenge and then our our fact or fiction and um, what's in the bag, but our fact or fiction is a little different. Today, we're gonna have you guys be the ones who guess. And I wanna say something about yesterday's broadcast. Turns out that YouTube is having trouble, or like all, all the major sites are, just because of how many people are online right now. And we were trying to figure out what we had done wrong, but it, it turns out just yesterday, YouTube happened to be struggling to deal with all the traffic. I imagine they're trying to devote some extra server power to that, and ho hopefully it won't be a problem going forward, but Hope the, so. the internet has never felt the strain like it is right now. So. Yes, so if we have freezing issues again today, please let us know, but we didn't schedule this broadcast in advance, and we didn't turn off the chat and turn it back on, so we're hoping that that will, that will help, because perhaps that played a role, but it might have just been number of people online causing YouTube to freeze. Oh, as near as we could tell, there was like five minutes of problems and then things went back to fine. So if, if there were problems again, we'll just pause it, go do something for a few minutes, come back and you can re restart it and, and in theory it should work. But Hopefully it will. Yeah, we're excited for today. Yes. So we are going to start off with an art showcase because we had so many fantastic circle drawings come in. I'm going to share my screen with you and then we will pull up our art drawings. Yeah, this was kind of a fun prompt. It was a fun it prompt. Turns out there's a lot you can do with circles. And Math Dad, as usual, Math Dad has not seen any of these. <laughs> so he is looking forward to this. This wonderful little mouse that likes cheese <laughs> from Grace loved it. Sure. We had a lot of great landscape pictures. So here's a house and a flower. And I love that, see Kimberly? Um, blotted out the na last name because we announced yesterday only pictures with first names only in our little internet safety lesson. Oh, so flower, I like the flower is my favorite. Flower's flower is great. And then here's a tree. I love that it's got roots too and a little bird, all with circles and ovals. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's me on a hot air balloon. Yeah. Have you ever been <laughs> on a job. hot air balloon? I have never been on a hot air balloon. This one was using some of those, I forget what they're called. You know, like the little circles where you can use Spirograph. the pen? Spirographs, <laughs> yeah. I thought those were fantastic. Yeah. And it's really cool to see how just with ovals, with a spirograph, you can get some really cool patterns. And then I love, <laughs> loved this loved this monster nice here. Job, some kind of modern art style uh, circles. And chalk art circle drawing, <laughs> fantastic. We've got some portraits of people with circles. An Eiffel Tower, like with dots. So this is sort Whoa. of like the, the like the pixel art, or what do they call it? Pointillism. Yeah, Isn't that great? yeah. So you were mentioning Wassily Kandinsky. Was that somebody yeah. here? Found some other nice. So the, yeah, this this reminds wow. me of like impressionist paintings. Love it. Very easy to draw. Polywog. Nicely <laughs> done. Loved this one. Isn't that cute? It is. And then we've got a cookie island with a dungeon. <laughs> Very creative. And a turtle. If I ever get trapped in a dungeon, I want it to be on a cookie island. A cookie island would be a great oh, place to get turtle, trapped. Though, so, so cute. Look, singing a song and I don't know the words. <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming a common motif in a lot of our art. <laughs> and then we've got fish and seaweed and bubbles. I thought that was a great piece as well. Oxygen, Whoa. water, chemicals, hydrogen. Circles are great for drawing molecules. Oh, Bailey's going to be a teacher, I can tell. Math Dad, stubby snowman, <laughs> <laughs> and a heart and an owl. I loved this owl. Good job, Anya, and good job, Chloe. This one I thought was just beautiful. So any guesses, Math Dad? How do you think they did this? Oh, man, is that watercolor? So they said they used markers, but then they got a Q-tip wet, ah. and they, like, blended the colors of the markers. And then the circles are done with crayon. So if you do crayon, since the crayon is kind of waxy, and then you use markers or watercolors, you get sort of this stained glass window effect. It's beautiful, isn't it? Those are really round circles, too. Maybe they trace something. I don't yeah, know. Or... Most, most people are not that good at drawing circles. Yeah, I thought that one was beautiful. And then we've got some more water oh, molecules. Great job, Joanna. Joanna. Uh, math dad. 
<laughs> it looks like you've got a bunch of droids around you singing the song. You don't know the words. I love it. Good job, Michaela. And an alphabet circles. And I thought this was cool. Like you really can make just about anything from circles. They made all the letters of the alphabet using ovals. Yeah, they're, they're doing a lot of stuff I hadn't even thought of. You know what those look like? The, the little cells? Like the... Yeah, yeah, they kind of do look yeah, like yeah. cells. And then a pair of dancing. Uh -huh. Dancing, and almost, or I can't tell if it's, they almost look like they could be elephants to me. See the long nose and the, the ears? So cute. And then Claire did this great this great picture with it looks like some animals on skateboards cat surfing. Is, cat is falling in the air. And, and the dog, dog is, is trying to save the cat. <laughs> oh yay, it's a dog hero saving the cat. I love it. Some more kind of modern art style circles. I thought the colors here were fantastic. Ooh, so wait, go, go, go back. Are they okay? Ah, so yeah, when you mix these colors, so they they so they got blue on red, they got purple, and yeah, they got blue and on yellow, yellow and they got, got green. green. Oh. Yep. Very nice. Good job, Kai. Oh, yeah. Raining cheese. And there's Math Dad's house, Science Mom's house. Awesome. I love it, Liam. Circus Clown. Cheese. Mr. Cycler. I loved seeing just the variety in the circle art. We got so much variety. And train here. Good job, Carter. Science Mom and Math Dad. I don't know the words to the song. And look, I'm <laughs> saying, no, stop. <laughs> And then this one sort of looks modern art-ish as well. I just love really the, nice the patterns. patterns. Yeah. yeah, great patterns. And then look, a three-dimensional circle art structure. Are, are those big hula hoops? Like, so that, that's a, somebody really likes hula hooping if they've got that many, many hula, hoops. I think, I, I think that might be hula hoops. That's great. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Science Mom and Math Dad. You're singing the song again. And it looks big Billy big, Bobs and Bubbles. Bobs bubbles. Awesome. <laughs> All right, and we'll do two more. So, fantastic peacock here with circles Adara. and a flower. And Amelia's, Love that. yes. And then we'll end on Kyle's. Good job, Kyle. All right, got to <laughs> find my mouse again. Everyone's got more hair than me, even, Everyone... even in circle art. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So a huge thank you to everyone who turned in art and submitted art. And if you're wondering, where do I submit art? Because we did have a few questions about that. Let me show you really quick. So I updated um, this post on Facebook. I pinned it to the top of the page. It says Quarantine Week 2, and it has all the prompts. And then Monday, I will put Quarantine Week 3 up there with all the prompts so that you can do them in advance. Now, you don't want to go and comment on this main post. You want to click on the album and then comment under the drawing prompt. So for tomorrow, it's Imagine Life on Another Planet. And those are the ones that you can share over the weekend. And you can submit your art there and take when you do take a minute to go through and just see all the other fantastic art that's been shared and you can comment on other people's art and you know give likes and hearts and give feedback and enjoy just the creativity and everything that's going on with these art and engineering challenges and if you're not on facebook you can also post your art to instagram with the hashtag science mom squad and we have had a couple people email us and say look i don't do social media i'm not on facebook or instagram that's totally fine. In that case, you can email it to art at science.mom. Although depending on the state of our inbox, sometimes we see those right away and sometimes we get overwhelmed and it will take us several days to see them. So those are those are the places where you can share your art. Right, keep them coming. We're really enjoying them. Oh, we are. They are fantastic. And we will have another little art showcase um, a little bit later. But now I prepared something kind of special for you guys. We learned about chemistry this week and I thought it would be fun if we went back and just visited some of the more satisfying um, experiments we did with a little series of video clips. So I have a video to share with you and it's about um, six minutes long and I'll still be talking as the video is playing and I'll share with you some close up shots that let you appreciate some of the stuff we did because with our web camera, it's a little hard to see and with our, by me recording it and then doing a screen share, I can show it just a little bit better. So we're going to share the screen. And then oh, we're going to come to my messy desktop and do chemistry highlights. Here we go. So I mentioned at the end of last week that we did Mendos and soda and Mendos and soda is a bit of a mystery to me because when I went to Texas, 
it didn't work at all. And then here in Nevada, it works great. So what is going on? So these are the same, same Mentos, similar brands of Coke. One of them worked great. One of them did not work at all. But I will say that this right here is not a very good comparison because not only am I changing location, I'm also changing temperature. The soda on the right is cold, had been in the fridge for a day, and the soda on the left is warm. And so let's look real quick at what happens when we change the temperature of soda. So the, the elevation mattered because of pressure. We're, it's still a mystery. And when people did Mentos and soda and shared their videos with me, we saw the same thing where for a lot of people, it worked really well, but some people would say, oh, that was disappointing and it didn't work. So here's warm soda. And these are all right in front of my house. Here's room temperature soda. You can see it does not go as high. And then here is soda that was in the fridge overnight. So it's really cold. Does not go nearly as high. But if we compare this soda in the fridge with soda in the fridge, one in Nevada, one in Texas, you can see there's still a big difference. The one in Texas just does not go nearly as high, doesn't have nearly as much energy, is not as spectacular, and I have not figured out why. This is still a mystery to me. So if you went back to Texas today and tried this, you think you'd get a similar result? Or? Yes, I think I would, because the, the school that I was at in Texas, it's called Dexter, pause real fast, that school, I asked them, you know, they, they mentioned that they'd tried Mentos and soda and it had not worked. I asked them about it and they said they'd tried multiple times and we, we did extensive experimenting there. We got 20 plus bottles of soda from different stores and locations and all of them were just as underwhelming as that one. Poor Texas. So yeah. who knows, who knows, it's a mystery. All right, we also talked a little bit of this week about how water, which I'm pouring into this jar, is not the same as rubbing alcohol. Water and rubbing alcohol are both clear liquids. They both look similar, but because the molecule that makes up that liquid is different, they behave very differently. And if you put water and rubbing alcohol into a jar with salt and then shake it up, the water and salt will dissolve together and you're not gonna even see the salt anymore. It will all be dissolved. But the rubbing alcohol and salt, when you shake it up, something really cool happens called salting out. You're actually gonna take your rubbing alcohol, if it's about 50% concentrated, you're gonna take that rubbing alcohol and it's gonna separate out into two layers, salty water on the bottom and rubbing alcohol on top. And the rubbing alcohol on top will be more concentrated. So meth added, I don't know if you Wait. can see, the star on the right, you can see there's still salt on the bottom, right? Yeah, it didn't mix in as well. And you, dissolve. it's hard to see the layer there. There is a layer there. But I know right now, if you're looking at it, you're like, science mom, they both look the same. It just looks like two jars of water. But when I put food coloring in there, you'll be able to see that they're very different liquids. So when salt dissolves in water, is that a chemical reaction? Is that actually changing? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. So look, there's the food coloring dropping into the salt water and it's like, whoa, this water is more dense. I'm not sinking because I'm not as concentrated as the salt water, it just floats on top. But we drop the food coloring into the jar with rubbing alcohol, it sinks down through the rubbing alcohol and then just forms a layer on top of that more dense salt water. Isn't that awesome? That's pretty cool. And then of course the, the layer of liquid on the top, that rubbing alcohol that's turning green now, that is your more concentrated rubbing alcohol. So you could carefully pour that off and you could use that as more concentrated rubbing alcohol if you wanted to. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Use it to clean wounds or rub salt in your yeah, wounds. Yeah, it's, it's a good disinfectant. <laughs> and then there's a, a picture and you can see that there's still salt. Um, and now the cool thing about rubbing alcohol is that it behaves very differently with, with markers. So here's a Sharpie marker, permanent marker. If we spread rubbing alcohol on it, it's going to start to go into solution. It's gonna start to dissolve. But you put rubbing alcohol on a dry erase marker, no change. Yeah, I, I always figured dry erase should be super easy to clean, should come off super easily. So it'll, this, it'll this wipe is surprising. Off. So dry erase will wipe off easily. You can just wipe that off, but it is it stays together really well and it does not dissolve in water. It does not dissolve in rubbing alcohol. Now, in just a minute, we're gonna do a second. You see, if I want to get it off, I have to kind of try and scrape it. And if I rub it off, it comes off really easily. You can see that there's white underneath there. 
but the Sharpie is totally blending in with the rubbing alcohol. Yeah. So if you ever get Sharpie on something that you don't want it to be on, rubbing alcohol will take it off. All right, and then this one's super fun. Did you see this one, Math Dad? I don't know if you've seen this one. So dry erase marker, and I drew an arrow. That's all written with dry erase and that dot. And then the other one is a Sharpie marker, just like before, only this time we used red instead of black. And now, instead of pouring rubbing alcohol on, we're going to pour water on. What do you think is going to happen, Math Dad? I, th I think I, di I did see this one. And it, it didn't happen as well during class, but you wanted the, the letters to float up. Yeah. Yep, yep. The <laughs> letters float. because And the, the reason why they're floating is because that ink stays together well. It has some sil silicon in it that helps it stick together. But it's designed to wipe off a dry erase board. And so it will float really well. And then once you get them floating, you know, I blew on the water a little bit and you could see the, see the letters sort of moving around. I'm gonna skip ahead just a tiny bit to our next, our next activity. Hopefully you got a chance to try yourself because this is really cool. Drop of water, drop, drop of rubbing alcohol in the middle of a thin layer of water. And you get this crazy thing happening where all the water pulls back. And if you put a little bit more, you can see really cool patterns on the side. And again, that's all because of the fact that water is a polar molecule and those water molecules really like each other, whereas rubbing alcohol has those carbons in it and does not mix quite as well and it has way lower surface tension. It's a then, lot of action. It is. Considering you're not doing anything, it's just sitting there. Yeah. And if you wait wait long enough, I mean, it will it will all mix together, but you usually have to give it a little help. Okay, and then here's our last one. We tried doing um, burning steel wool because steel wool reacts with oxygen to form iron oxide, and then it's heavier and it will tend and it will weigh more than the steel wool on the other side of the scale. But the amount we used was pretty small, and so we did it again after class with larger thing of steel wool. And you can see here we're blowing on it to get it to to burn well to make sure that whole thing of steel wool burns. And then by the time we got to the end, it totally was, let's see if you can, there you go. You can see it's heavier and it's a darker color than the other steel wool because of that chemical reaction, because the iron combined with oxygen, so now it's heavier. Then of course we did um, pH yesterday, which was tons of fun. And this I loved. I had one of our one of our fans on the Facebook page, they said we didn't have any cabbage juice, so we tried it with food coloring. So what do you think, Math Dad, with food coloring? If you put all those things into water that has food coloring, are you going to see any color change? Just water. Just uh, water and food coloring. No, I don't think. Well, I don't know. Maybe some of them would react. But the answer is only with the bleach. <laughs> okay. So, oh, the gash. Yep. The, the bleach. I should have assumed the bleach. Would yep. The color. bleach is going to denature the food coloring. Is going to make it sort of break apart, and that's why you know if you bleach your clothes, you can get rid of the color, but everything else stayed pretty much the same. <laughs> so I thought that was great. Yeah. It's really surprising that you can get so many colors from... From the, just cabbage the, juice. Ca cabbage juice, yeah. Yeah, it really is. Now, I know that there are a lot of aspects of chemistry that we didn't touch on this week. We were trying to just kind of give a quick overview, give you some fun things to explore. And we did talk about the periodic table. And on today's worksheet, I drew out the table for you, how you would see it if everything was in order. Because usually... This little part right here is usually down below on the bottom. And I think it's kind of cool just to see how long it is if you put everything in order. I think you pointed it at the wrong spot. Just so the, this, this long two thin rows here yep. usually get, I'm, I'm blocking it now. These two rows get chopped out usually and, and put on the bottom just because this is such a long graphic to draw and posters are usually not quite that long. And so to make it a little easier to use, they usually put it on the bottom. So. That was a quick overview of what we covered in chemistry. Next week, we're going to do physics. But depending on how long quarantine goes, I bet we will have time to come back and visit chemistry in more detail at a later date. But I hope you enjoyed learning about chemistry and had a chance to do some of these fun reactions. I thought they were fun. I was, this video showed we went through a lot this week. We did. We did. We did go through quite a few this week. All right. And now next, we... A the, the, the couple of questions had come in. Okay. So w one question was, um, are you able to write dry erase over top of a Sharpie and then just wipe both of them off? Yes. And I don't think I have a plan. What, really? Um, 
this is something I've never tried, but I have seen it before and I am pretty sure it's possible. So let's give it a try right now. I have a plastic bottle here. I'm going to take a Sharpie and draw a line on it. And now we'll find out, moment of truth, find out if this works. We'll take a dry erase marker, color over the top, and then we've got a cloth here. We're able to wipe it off. Uh, mostly. Yeah, mostly. mostly. If we draw over it again, I think we'll be able to get more of it off. I was sure the answer was going to be no. <laughs> so th this has to do with the ink that makes up the Sharpie and makes up dry erase. So the ink in the Sharpie is soluble in rubbing alcohol. That means it will dissolve in rubbing, rubbing alcohol. The ink in the dry erase marker will not. But both inks have some similarities. The difference is that the Sharpie marker, this dye, is sort of bonded to molecules that are designed to stick really well to anything they come into contact with. The dye in the dry erase marker is designed to stick together really well and not bond to other things because you want it to be able to wipe off the board. So if you combine these two, that property that the dry erase marker has of bonding to itself well, but not bonding to other things, kind of it's able to pick up a lot of this dye and you'll be able to get most of the Sharpie off. Not quite all of it, but we did get quite a bit of it off. Yeah. Okay, another question had come in. Is how many Mentos is a good number to add when you're doing the Mentos in the soda? Good question. It depends on the size of the soda bottle. If you're doing a two liter bottle, I would recommend adding five to six Mentos. If you're doing a smaller, smaller bottle, like the ones that come in the six pack, then I think three Mentos is enough. I would have said one or two, but yeah, I get that would be an, another thing to experiment with. It, it would be a good thing to experiment. It's, it's kind of hard to get them all in at once. That, that That's the tricky part is if you, you can't, you've got to have them lined up and ready to fall I, or, or often we, we will actually. I recommend um, poking them with a safety pin and then putting floss or thread and needle, using a thread and needle to thread them together. Because if they're all hooked up together, then you can drop them in pretty easily. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we've tried it before where we thought we could do it and one of them would fall in and it would start exploding as you were just trying to put the others in. Yeah, that wasn't as fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get hit in the face with soda if you're trying it that way. All right, other quick question. Um, well, there's career advice for future YouTubers is, yes. a, is a question. So. so this is what we're getting to next and I'm quite excited about this. Now, when I do school visits, I'll and every year I'll, I'll visit dozens of elementary schools in Southern Nevada where I live. And it's amazing to me how many young kids plan to be YouTubers when they grow up and how many already have channels. This is a really common thing. And in fact, not that long ago, a uh, large organization did a national survey where they asked kids aged six to 17 what they wanted to be when they grow up. And they found that three quarters of the people that they surveyed wanted to be YouTubers when they grew up. And that's kind of amazing if you think about it. When I was a kid, when we were kids, what were the popular careers, Matt, Dad? So I, I knew a lot of kids who wanted to be doctors, lawyers. I wanted to be a baseball player. Fireman. Um, yeah, police officer, baseball player. Like these were sort of the careers that people, when we were growing up, that people wanted to have. And they were careers where you would have a definite employer. You know, if you're a doctor, you're going to be working in a hospital. If you're a lawyer, you're going to be working for a law firm. If you're a baseball player, you'll be working for, you know, this, this major league. You'll have an employer, you'll have a boss. A YouTuber, on the other hand, is more like running your own business. You're self-employed. So I prepared a little slideshow and we're gonna sort of take you through the behind the scenes of Science Mom and how what our costs are on our YouTube channel, what our revenue is, and how long we've had it. First, a little quick little background. I started my YouTube channel in at the end of 2016. December of 2016 is when we posted our first video. So 2017 was really our first year on YouTube. And it's three years, took three years to reach um, about 7,000 subscribers. And then just this last two weeks, all of a sudden things sort of went bigger because of quarantine. And now I think we're at 27,000 subscribers. Is that right? Something like that. So the numbers I'll show you are a lot bigger in terms of our views than they would have been had quarantine not happened. And had we not had school closures, we would have been much smaller. But in any case, let's, let's pull up the slideshow 
and we'll take you behind the scenes. And keep the questions coming because Science Mom Krista and Liza and Emily will be texting them to us. So if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat and um, we, will, we will answer them. All right, we're gonna go up to the top of our slideshow. And I want to say first, there is a really common misconception that I find a lot of people have about YouTube. And that is that most YouTubers are millionaires. And that if you have a YouTube channel that has a couple thousand subscribers, then you're earning lots of money. And to understand, to understand this, I, I thought it would be helpful to just point out huge channels like Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast has 33 million subscribers and you'll see him often do things, stunts where he'll say, like, you know, he tweets on Twitter fairly frequently. I'm gonna give away $30,000 to one random person who retweets this tweet and then he'll do it. Or he posts videos like the last person to take their hands off a million dollars gets to keep it. And it's a legit video where he's giving away a million dollars. You've got these four people holding their hands on a stack of cash and they're, you know, they go like a full like 40 hours trying to stay awake, trying to keep their hand on it. And then when one of them takes the hand off, he's Mr. Beast is like, oh, don't feel bad. You'll get $30,000 as a consolation prize. So clearly this guy is doing really well on YouTube and has a lot of money. And if you look here, the stats here, um, views for the last 30 days on March 22nd, his channel had 18 million views. And now here's the issue with people thinking that then anyone who has a big YouTube channel has a lot of views and will have millions of dollars of ad revenue. They don't understand scale. So math dad, is there a big difference between 272 million and 300,000? Uh, yes, yes, there is. <laughs> Huge like, like difference. Nine, it's 900 times more. 900 times more. So if we graph just views per month, the views that Mr. Beast got this month and the views that Science Mom got this month, and again, this 300,000 is way bigger than my channel has ever had, thanks to quarantine. Um, you can't even see the green. That's right. So this That's, is a bar chart and there, there's a purple bar next to a green bar, but the green bar is so tiny. That so it, small, you can't even see it. And yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the point of the graph. So if we zoom in really, really far so that you can't, you know, we're just to the first 20,000 there. Now you can finally see the green. 20 million. 20 million. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And super, super small. So let's that's kind of thing. Thing number one. I'll go back real quick. Thing number one I want you to realize is that YouTube if you're going to be earning money from ad revenue, it rewards the giants. You've got to be a giant for this to be a serious source of income. And if you're small, you're not gonna have a lot of income from YouTube. And that's an important thing for people to, to realize and to know. All right, now let's talk about business expenses. So, well, well, are you gonna, did you make good money from YouTube or is that coming up? It's coming up, okay. we'll get to that. All right, so business, business expenses for the Science Mom YouTube channel. Um, we have a business license and in the state of Nevada, that's $350 that we need to pay every single year to have our business, which is we we operate as a limited liability company, a simple LLC. That was the simplest, easiest one to set up when we set it up three years ago. And every single spring, that $350 fee comes around, we have to pay it. And it's different in each state. We have a PO box and that's an expense that I think is important. It's also fairly expensive, about $300 a year. We have story blocks, which allows us to download stock footage that we use. And I would say that's also like an essential business expense for us, 149 a year. We have ConvertKit, StreamYard, which we're using right now to stream our videos, Linktree and later. So those are all some things, but let's, let's break it all down by month. So how much is it by month? There we've got our column and then payroll. And this is our most important, our most important thing because we have a Science Mom team. We have Science Mom Liza, Krista and Emily, and we could not do this quarantine show without them. And payroll is predicted to be roughly $3,000 a month. So our total costs, just over $3,500. Now let's go to income. So from school visits this year, and when I do a school visit, I'll go to a school for an entire day and I'll do science presentations back to back. So far this year, I earned $4,791 doing school visits. But unfortunately, that income stream is now completely gone all my school visits that I had scheduled for the latter part of March and in April and May are canceled because of the um, COVID-19. And then we also had a Kickstarter campaign that was successful earlier this November to help pay Science Mom Liza, Krista and Emily to produce the Atmosphere series. But again, um, that has been sustaining our channel for the last couple of months, but we're kind of coming to the end of that. So now let's look at monthly income. My total income from YouTube, which is higher than it has ever been, 38 cents. 38 cents. 
I earned 38 cents this last month on YouTube. Now, th that's not just not because you had so few views, but also because you don't have very many videos that are monetized. True. So if someone watches YouTube on YouTube Red, I do get a little bit of income if they're using YouTube Red. Um, but I only have one monetized video. And if all of my videos were monetized, I figured that I would be earning around between 30 and $50 a month. Hmm. So that's if every single video had ads and you know, if, and, if, and if I broke up longer videos with multiple ads, I could be earning about that much right now with how many views I have. And $50, I mean, that sounds a lot better than 38 cents, but that's not gonna be enough to, to, pay, to pay your rent. And you, with ads, it might be harder for these videos to be shown in a school. Yes, so the reason why I don't have ads is because I, I'm, an, I'm an idealist and I really feel like the education should be ad-free. You shouldn't have advertisement in education. All right, Patreon. Thanks to the wonderful patrons we have, our Patreon has grown a lot. We have $1,800 a month on Patreon. Sponsors, we have zero. And that brings us down to about $1,800 of income each month. So you can see that we are we are currently operating in the red. Boy, is it that bad? No wonder we're always so poor. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt's dad's like, oh man, I had, we hadn't run the numbers for a while. I didn't realize it was this bad. So. Let's stop sharing real quick and let's let's talk about this a bit now And I want to say first like the point of this lesson is not to be like hey, please give us money um, We what I really want you to get from this because I know that so many kids want to be youtubers when they grow up I want you to appreciate that this is a career that is more challenging than most people think so if you if you are under the opinion that you can just film yourself having fun and be an instant celebrity and make millions I want to be the first one to tell you that is not true. It is a lot of work. In fact, most, most people, I'm gonna share, share with you one quick example real fast. When I was, so the, the channels that make it big are usually showing people who have spent a lifetime developing a certain skill set that they've either learned a lot about something or they've, they've become an expert in something and then that's when they're able to make a YouTube channel. So, so yes. it, so, so they didn't set out to be YouTubers, they actually... But, but, people, but people who do set out to be YouTubers, so I, Silly Science with Simon, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, we're, we're friends from, met on Instagram, he lives in Australia, he started a YouTube channel recently, he's got 362 subscribers, and these vi videos have, you know, between 100 to 400-ish views. He's actually doing really well for having just started out. A lot of people, um, it's... It's a lot, it's really hard to get views when you first start out. Even if you make a great video, if you make a fantastic video and you post it online, if nobody knows you posted it online, nobody's gonna see it. And getting to the point where you have enough people who are watching you and enough people who like what you do enough to share it so that word of mouth starts to happen, that takes a lot of time. Most of the YouTubers that I know personally that I've talked to, you know, kind of behind the scenes and I've asked him like, okay, how long have you had your channel? When did you start earning enough that you could actually like, you know, pay your mortgage or pay your rent from YouTube? For most of them, it took three years and they didn't get enough income to pay their basic bills until they reached 100,000 subscribers. And 100,000 is way bigger than 100. So. Oh. Yeah, well, and that you've, this is you're referring to people who have actually succeeded, right? So even among those who managed to get a big enough channel, it, it took a long time and was a lot of effort and it is. continues to be a lot of effort. But how many people do you think tried and didn't make it to that stage? Oh, a lot more, a lot more. There are a lot more people who try to get a YouTube channel going and then kind of give up because it's so much work than there are people who make it. But if you see, like if you have a YouTuber you follow that you enjoy and you see them posting videos, you know, where they start their channel, and then six months later, they're like, oh, thank you, 10,000 subscribers, I can't believe it. Um, you, shouldn't, you, you should be like, well, I can't believe it too, because that's really, really rare. That hardly ever happens. All right, and real, we'll take just a couple, do we have any questions come in about YouTube? We'll take just a couple questions about YouTube or having a career as YouTuber, and then I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the financial side. I mean, the quick question that had come in was actually about the lanthanoid and actinoid series. Just one, one more time, because I... Yes, so we'll answer that chemistry question real fast, and then we'll then let's talk a little bit more about that. So 
the lanthanides and the actinides. That's these, these ones right down here. And I just totally mispronounced that. My apologies. So because these, this part is so long and also because this is these chemicals right here, these elements, these are not ones that we really use and talk about a lot. The ones that we use the most and talk about the most are up here. It makes more sense to take this, put it down on bottom, and then put the table together just so that visually we can see it better. That's why the periodic table is organized the way it is on posters with this part being down below. And, and again, if you want to, yeah, if you want to print out the notes for this, there, there's a free, free download and you can find it on, on Patreon. All right. So Math Dad, um, when I was preparing the slideshow and I showed him like, all right, you know, school visits, we don't have that income coming up anymore. And here is our current like deficit that we'll be operating with. We kind of like looked at the savings account and he's like, all right, we got two months to make this work. Like we can, we can support quarantine for two months. And then if it's still operating in deficit, we'll have to be like, and uh, show over. So um, just kind of a fun little math question, because these are the type of things that you think about if you have a YouTube channel. I'll turn this around right here. Oh, and you know what I just realized, babe? What we is are, that? We are not plugged into the ethernet. Do you oh. want to grab that real quick? Sure. We're on Wi-Fi. Okay, so here are the things that you that you think about. If you have a YouTube channel or a presence online, it's sort of like there's there's a there's a triangle. And people who know about you, people who are your fans and really like what you do, and then people who like it enough that they want to support you financially is this top part. And usually for a lot of people, it's about a 2% conversion. So of your total fan base, if you have a fan base of, you know, a thousand people, about two of those thousand people will be willing to support you financially. So your options are to try to increase this triangle as big as you can to make sure that you hit the size you need to, to have that support. So for, for us, we have our Patreon and we could figure out, you know, what's our goal for how many patrons we would need to get. But Math Dad was, we were talking about this and he's like, you know what? A lot of people, especially right now with how the economy is, they're not going to be able to contribute um, a monthly charge because they might be looked at, you know, they might be looking at losing their own job or other worries with how things are going. So he's like, but we've been getting requests for t-shirts and I have an idea for a t-shirt that I think people would really like. So Math Dad made a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm singing a song and I don't know the words. I'm singing a song I don't know no, the you words. You didn't have to sing the song. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long. But I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. So if you would like to buy a t-shirt, um, go to teespring.com stores stash slash science mom. And then math dad, let's figure out real quick. So our, if we have about a thousand, I think it was like a thousand two hundred. Let's just round and say it's that to make it so that we break even. And if we get nine dollars and eighty-two cents per t-shirt, how many t-shirts would our fans would we would we need to have our fans get collectively to make up that deficit? Okay, so the, we'll do, the, a, the do a quick math question. Back of the napkin math, because with this our number is already an estimate. We might as well just change this one into an estimate. So suppose this were ten dollars because it's awfully close to ten dollars well then 1200 divided by 10 is just 120 dollars uh, sorry 120 people times so 120 shirts is that what they 120, 120 shirts. shirts times ten dollars per shirt would equal twelve hundred dollars so so if 120 people got shirts <laughs> and now here's the real question because we have we have two different types of shirts we have the math dad shirt but then we also have Science Mom Squad shirts. So, Math Dad, do you think there will be more, I don't know the words to the song shirts sold, or more Science Mom shirts sold? <laughs> well, clearly they love the song so much that <laughs> <laughs> they would buy that shirt. I actually just think it would be funny to see people asking, why do you have a shirt that says you're singing a song you don't know the words? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say this is a great shirt. My, my prediction is that there will be more I'm singing a song I don't know the words to <laughs> sold. and than science mom but if you go to this website we made it public so you can see how many shirts are sold and so you can kind of watch and cheer along with us to see if that number gets up to 120 because if it does then we'd be we'd be not in the black i mean not in the red we'd be in the black right. which would be good yep 
All right. I, it, do let us know if you have questions about um, about YouTube and being a YouTuber. Um, we would be happy to answer them. And I would say, yeah, obviously, yeah, Science Mom d didn't start the channel to, to make money. We've got tried to view it just as a hobby, an expensive hobby, but she, she's done this full time and she, she's done a good job with it. And there's actually something kind of cool because we get to do this together. And I, we love that. I, I get yeah. to help. And I'm gonna, gonna mention that a little bit in my math lesson. So, um, oh, and so so we had two questions in the chat that I wanna address real, real quick. Someone asked, how do you buy those t-shirts? You can buy them right here, this link. So if you go to teespring.com slash stores slash science mom, and I'll post it to all the social media ch channels um, when we're done, then it brings up the store and you can buy the shirts and you can pick any style of shirt you want, hoodie, sweatshirt, t-shirt, socks, and you can pick the Science Mom Squad logo or the Singing the Song logo. And then someone asked, what would happen if you can't pay for a shirt? And this is something that's really important to me and has been ever since I started the channel. I want information to be freely available to as many people as possible. So quarantine will always be free. Um, the worksheets that we have will always be free and posted online where you can download them. And if you can't pay for a shirt, I don't want you to feel like you have to have one. I think there are there are enough other, other people who will who will help that I think we'll be able to keep this going. Yeah. Well, and it's okay if we don't sell a single shirt. It was fun just to make it. So. Oh, I'm gonna buy a shirt because <laughs> I I know that you would like you would like one. So that's right. It will remind me to sing the song more often. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm not getting you a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, should we do our math lesson and then we'll do fact or fiction? Let's let's do this. Let's talk some math. So okay. in today's math lesson, we're going to talk about Venn diagrams. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this is a concept you've heard of. I'm going to pull this up nice and close. So a Venn diagram is just a way of organizing uh, some, some data. And the first way I want to do it, I'm going to make a circle. I'm going to call this math dad's interests. So the, the things that I like. And then I'm going to have another one here for science mom's interests. So we can think about things like chess is something that I like a lot. And you know what? Science mom... She enjoys playing with me, but if I'm not around, she doesn't get out the chessboard and put play on her own. So I'd probably just put chess over here. And I love taking time lapses of sunsets, like going up to a viewpoint and setting up a camera and then watching, you know, for two hours, watching the sunset and doing a time lapse of the whole thing. I love that. Math Dad will do it with me, but it's not his favorite thing. So I'm going to write sunsets here. Yeah. It's something science mom really enjoys, really likes doing. All right, so I didn't put it inside the math dad circle because it didn't fit. But there are some things that we like to do together, of course. And I'll just list science as an example of that. We like to do experiments together. We like to talk about ideas and, and to, to try things out, to read new books and discover things. And yeah, so that belongs inside of both circles. And you know what? There are some things that neither of us enjoy that much. Like carbonated beverages. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so let me you just guys, write. You guys saw the faces Coke. we made when we when we drank the the soda. Yeah. Yeah, we just don't drink it that much. It's not 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 something that's inside of our our circles. Things we care a lot about. So in this way, we've managed to represent different items, and of course. Uh, this YouTube channel would have fit nicely in here. So as a married couple, the more we can do to do things that are inside of both of our circles, the, the better off we are. So that, that's one of the reasons why the, this YouTube channel has been a lot of fun for us. And yeah, as, as families, you guys should be looking for similar areas of interest. Like what are the things we have in common that we all enjoy and see what energy you can focus there. And that, that, that's just good advice for, for life. All right, so this Venn diagram helps us to organize information. And now I want to see if we can make an even more complicated Venn diagram. And I'm going to leave this challenge to you guys as well. But so here is 
what we're going to talk about. So fruit. And I'm going to make three circles here. Oops. All right. So that just says fruit. All right. So circle one is going to be for green fruit. Circle two here is going to be for, I'm just going to call it big fruit. And maybe. And big, do you mean like bigger than a golf ball? Uh, I don't bigger know. If, it just if I use the, the adjective big, it's, it's a little vague, but that's okay. And then I'm going to draw a third circle here. And I'm going to call this circle 2020. So, so that's going to be if I have eaten that fruit in the year 2020. Mm -hmm. All right. I and think I think we should we should actually fill this one out right now, and then I think the challenge that we should give people is to just make their own. Make I, their I, own. I like I like this, and then you, you could you you could do fruit if you want, or make up some other category and see if you can come up with some circles and make a Venn diagram. And then the the big challenge is: can you find something where every single region gets something in it? And there's a lot of regions here, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plus. The outside would be eight. Can we come up with eight different fruit that satisfy all of this? All right, so I'm gonna probably need science mom's help because right. fruit would definitely be inside of her circle of so, interest. Are we talking botanically speaking? And I, I think we should be because then that expands oh. it. So gr okay, sure. green fruit, let's put tomatillos as one. Tomatillos. Yeah, because they're definitely green. Okay, so this is just such. So have I had a tomatillo in 2020? Answer is no. And are they big? No, they're not, but they are green. So tomatillos here. All right, tomatillos is a green fruit. Watermelon, we're gonna okay. totally count watermelon as green because the outside is green. I, I, I like that. So watermelon, they're, they're big, and I have had watermelon in 2020. So I'm going to say it's gotta be inside these two circles, but no, no, no. Yeah. Wait, it's all three at once? Yeah. Oh, so it's in all three circles. That would be this region here. So watermelon. All right. So think of apples. So apples, are apples big? I don't think, I, I wouldn't yeah. use big for apples. So I'm gonna say outside that circle, are apples green? Ooh, maybe I should save that because they could do not be green or not green. Uh, I, uh, I'd say if it, if it can be green or if it has green, uh, we right. count it. Because so green is a tough color for fruit. I, okay. I've had green apples in 2020. So that would be, Inside both of these two circles, all right, I'm, I'm putting it. Apples. Okay. All right. All right. I'm running out of ideas of green fruit. I'm going to look in the chat and see right. if anyone has any ideas. Right. So let's just name some more fruit. Uh, it's like a strawberry. So strawberries are definitely not big. I have had them in 2020, and they're not green. So I'm going to put strawberries down here. Ooh. Okay. Um, grapes. Grapes can be green, and they're small. Okay. I've already done green and not big and had in 2020. Oh, so. you're trying to get one in each. That, that's right. I want to, yeah. So, so you, you we're absolutely right. We could add more than one, but ultimately my goal is to see if I could find one for all the regions. But, but yeah, it, it makes sense that some regions would have lots of things. I've got one for you. Durian. A durian. A durian is big. It's green. And it's something that we have not had ever. It supposedly smells and Smells really, really bad, but tastes good. A durian. Yeah. Okay. I, of course, that's what I was going to think of. <laughs> All right. All right. So what, what's a persimmon is a fruit, right? Yes. I, I have not had a persimmon. They are orange and they are not big. Oh, <gasps> persimmon goes on the outside then. You see that? Yeah. A persimmon, two M's. <sighs> I don't even know how to, how to spell a persimmon, but um, okay. Only two left to go. A cantaloupe. A cantaloupe is big. It's not green. And have I had a cantaloupe in 2020? I've had a cantaloupe in 2020. Okay, I'm going to put it in here then. Avocado is a good green one. Ah, okay. So cantaloupe. So it turns out I've got all my green bases covered. So they're okay. green. They're probably not very big. And I've had it in 2020. So I, I put, uh, what did we just say? Can, um, avocado. Avocados in here. All right. 
All okay. right. Is there some big fruit that I eat or have not eaten in 2020 that is not? Well, green? since we're talking about um, fruit, botanically speaking, let's say squash. I don't think you've had squash. Are you telling me squash or fruit? But if botani <laughs> botanically speaking, it's the ripened ovary around seeds, it's fruit. All right. Squash. All right. We'll, we'll go with this. And I saw that someone just asked, how would you be able to tell if a durian went bad if it already smells bad? That's a very good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm not sure. But obviously there are a lot of other fruits and the, the fruits are going to go somewhere like a, a kiwi. Kiwis are green. I'd say they're not big. I don't think I've had one in 2020. So in that case, it would have gone up. Would have gone up with tomatillos. Here. Yep. And yeah, in, in theory, we should be able to classify all fruits somewhere here, either outside the circles or inside some circles or parts of others. And yeah, that's how we can use Venn diagrams. So my challenge for you guys then is to come up with your own Venn diagram. And if you can come up with three different categories and you can find something that fits in each of the categories, then that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I will, I'll add a picture of Venn diagram challenge to our little album so that if you want to share it on Facebook there, you can, or you can always email us or share it on Instagram with the hashtag science mom squad. So real quick, we didn't, um, I didn't make up a little slide of our schedule today. So let me show you our engineering challenge and our drawing prompt real fast. So our, our drawing prompt is to draw a scene from outer space. Whoops, and I didn't realize I still had that banner there. We'll get rid of that. Imagine life on another planet. So this can be, you can go a lot of directions with this. It could be like a space settlement or it could be a completely different planet. Like what if there was a planet orbiting a red dwarf star? What type of life would that planet have? You can get real creative and do anything you'd like. You could Drunk even, aliens. yeah, settlement on Mars, aliens, any type of scene from another planet that you would like. And then our engineering challenge is to design a Rube Goldberg machine. And again, here's the area where you'll find all of the drawing prompts for the whole entire week. And we are going to now try and do our engineering challenge after fact or fiction, because okay. we, we didn't do fact or fiction Oh yeah, yet. we're out of order here. All right. <clears throat> so today we're gonna do our engineering challenge. And then after the engineering challenge, we have a fun Desmos game with Venn diagrams that we're gonna do. So today's fact or fiction is a little bit different. Today, we're gonna be asking you guys in the chat to tell us if it's true or false. And just for fun, we did little fact or fiction facts about Science Mom and Math Dad because we sort of feel like we're getting to know you guys pretty well. We've shared a lot about us over the past few weeks and I thought, ah, this might be kind of fun. So fact number one, Science Mom had cancer when she was 18 years old. True or false? Is that true or false? Did I have fact cancer, cancer when I was 18 years old? I'm seeing several trues. This is one's a little bit of a trick question because I did have cancer, but it wasn't when I was 18. It was when I was 20. <laughs> so when I was 20, I had cancer. And we told the story about how um, Math Dad and I kind of dated by email all through my chemotherapy. And then when he proposed, he had more hair than I did. I was bald. But now the tables have turned. And nearly <sighs> 20 years later, I've got hair and he's bald. <laughs> all right. Fact number two, Math Dad could balance a broom on his chin. Chin. Yep, Math Dad can balance a broom on his chin. Here, you hold this paper. I'm going to go get a broom because I think they're going to want proof. No hints. No hints. <laughs> <laughs> false, false, true, true, false, false. The tables have turned. Yes, yes. No, no, no hair for me. <laughs> true, 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 true. Oh. All right, I think right, you can do it. Let's find most, out. Most people are saying true here. All right, so. So this is going to be kind of tricky. I'm going to have to like scoot all the way back. So see can, if we can. I can just wedge it against the ceiling here and then. No, it, no. You can't fall. <laughs> got to get so, down on your knees. All right. Whoa, I've got to get really low just because this room doesn't allow. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of tricky. So if he's standing up and there's a taller ceiling, he can do it even better, but he can. He can balance a broom on his chin. How are you doing it, Math Dad? Well, basically, I'm just keeping my eyes right below it. Keep, he keeps his eyes right below the broom yep, so, so that so, he's, so, yep, he's so looking me, at it. So if it starts moving to one side, I just move over. 
<laughs> Nicely done. Give some claps for Math Dad in the chat. He can balance a broom on his chin. They're saying that's crazy. It is true. All right. Fact number three, science mom almost failed her first chemistry class in college. She got a D minus. Is that true or false? We're still talking about yeah. your broom, broom yeah. balancing. Yeah, these are good questions. Do I know the answer to this question? Do you know the answer to this one? Uh, I think I know the answer to this one. It's true. It's true. And you guys in the chat know it too. I did almost fail my first chemistry in cl class in college. I got a D minus and I have to say I was pretty embarrassed and sad that I almost failed that class. And the reason why I failed was because I wasn't studying enough and because I was a little bit weak in math and we were doing a lot of balancing equations and stuff that involved simple algebra and my algebra skills were not as strong as they could have been, but I didn't let that hold me back. I went on to get a minor in chemistry. And in my organic chemistry class, I, I took it sort of as a special challenge because that class has such a reputation for being really hard. And I studied like no other. And several of the exams, I got 100%. And it was kind of fun because the professor would display the scores on the board. Like, you know, here are the scores for the test. You can see that, you know, the average was like 60. And then there would be this one outlier of 100%. And I could hear all the classmates around me being like, who got 100? <laughs> it was me. All right. Was that the class we were in together? The chemistry one that I got a D in it? Yeah. Yeah. The one where you fell asleep almost every time, but you got a better grade than I did. That sounds yep. right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the class. All right. Next fact. Math Dad has spent more time driving a tractor than driving a car. Is that true or false? Math Dad has spent more time driving a tractor than driving a car. Yeah. A lot of people are saying true. And some people are saying false. false. I've got a nice little false with tractor emoji. So this was true when Math Dad was in his 20s. Definitely when we first met in college, he had spent more time driving a tractor than driving a car. But enough time has passed now. That no, it's, just, it's no longer true. I've, I've definitely driven more in a car now. But yeah, for at least a, a decade after I had left the farm, it was probably true because on the farm, you spend a lot of time just driving back and forth, you're plowing the field, you're baling hay. You're, you're, you spend a lot of time in the yep. tractor. Yep. <laughs> Fun. All right. Fact number, next fact, science mom was a certified Sawyer chainsaw operator and worked on several forest fires. So is that true or false? Was I a certified Sawyer? Did I work on forest fires? I'm seeing a lot of trues. That is true. Um, favorite job. Favorite job I ever had, probably was working for the Forest Service. They paid her money to go hiking and... And to use a chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. It was great. All right. Math Dad was a state wrestling champ when he was in high school. That's our last one. Math Dad was a state wrestling champ when he was in high school. Most people are saying true. I'm just seeing some more trues, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, and a few people are saying false. If you said false, you are correct. True, but false. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I was a district champion, but I didn't win state. Um, yeah, but I, I I did. What the? Somebody knew it false. They won. You won district. Like somebody had actually written that before I said it. How did you know that? They're super smart. They're stalking me online. Yeah. Oh, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> or or they looked at the answer key because the answer key is also on Patreon. Oh, okay. One of the two. That, yep. that makes more sense. Otherwise, I can't you know more about me than science mom because she didn't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to double check with them last night. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this sort of fun, more personal um, fact or fiction. And now we're ready to get to our engineering challenge, which is to build a Rube Goldberg machine. If you have never seen a Rube Goldberg machine, it's worth taking a minute to look it up online because they are incredible. You have these, these big contraptions. You can make them out of pretty much anything. But the real key to a Rube Goldberg machine is that there is a chain reaction that you have one thing move and then it causes another thing to move and that thing causes another thing to move. And so our challenge, engineering challenge for you this weekend is to make some type of Rube Goldberg machine. Math Dad and I are going to see if we can make a simple one for you right now and we're just gonna use dominoes, yarn, paper, marbles. paper and marbles. Oh, so maybe some beads too. Yeah, we're 
We're going to try. We're, we're, we're going to see, see it, what we can do. It might not work, though. That, that's the thing. So when I was a kid, they had this board game called uh, Mousetrap. And it was all about building this Rube Goldberg machine where something would knock over a guy and marble would roll down and it would cause and something else to happen. And eventually this catapult would go off and this guy would flip up and land in a basket. I mean, it was pretty cool. So... All right, so we, we were thinking before we started, oh, okay, we already have uh, a, roller coaster. a roller coaster. So we could start off by running a marble down this roller coaster, which and I think is a little crooked. I'm not sure if that'll even run a It is a little a crooked, but it should work. And if it hits a domino right here at the end, I think it'll hit it hard enough, even without us modifying it, that it should knock the domino over. And then we're going to have a chain of dominoes and head over make them go around so that they knock this minion off the table and this minion is going to be attached to a piece of string that is attached to our inertia beads and if it works then putting the marble down our roller coaster will make the inertia beads jump out of the cup that's the goal all right so actually why don't we test it right now with the marble so you've you got to test these often ah Try that one more time nope that didn't even go down. All right. So mm -hmm. we, we successfully knocked over a domino. Put it up close again. All right, one more time. Try, try that right. again. Whoops. Uh. <laughs> it, it is a good idea when you're building these to test out each step. Okay. That's going to work. So okay. we'll be able to knock over dominoes. That's step number one. So I'm, Matt Dad's going to set up our dominoes, and I'm going to get the um, little sense. minion falling off to our inertia beads. Yeah, so I think we want to tie it to it, we want it to fall off, and then I thought if, if it swings down and actually hits um, like this, and then this falls down, this will pull down the inertia bead a little bit harder. Or... That's a cool idea, I just don't know if we have time. Okay, all right, we'll, 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 we'll try this. Little minion. What, can you stand up straight? His. His hat's too heavy. <laughs> yeah. I, I think his feet are kind of crooked. Uh, all right. Well, he's a, he's a, gonna lay down then. That's there's our minion. All right. We gotta be careful not to bump the table here. But yeah, when Science Mom told me we were gonna do this, I was actually pretty worried because uh, these are hard. If you if you've seen the videos, they, they look really cool. And I've seen some really cool ones with marbles that are bouncing all over and trigger one thing or another. But uh, I saw a, um, a question just now related to YouTube that was a really good one that asked, how do we edit videos? And I will tell you, we used iMovie for the first three, almost three years that we had our YouTube channel. And then we switched to DaVinci Resolve. We used iMovie because it's a free software that you have if you have a Mac. But DaVinci Resolve is also free. And holy cow, DaVinci Resolve is so much better. So to any any kids watching or people, families watching, any elderly people who are shut at home feeling isolated watching, anybody who has a YouTube channel, I gotta tell you, DaVinci Resolve is so much better than iMovie. Go download DaVinci, it's free. They are not a sponsor. <laughs> oh no, I'm not being paid to say this. Um, but yeah, DaVinci Resolve is so much better than iMovie. Yeah. Now, we don't actually yeah, subscribe to the, the Adobe suite. Um, just just a, one of those things you have to pay monthly on as a subscription. But uh, it, it definitely has some nice tools. And a lot of the professional channels you'll see use the uh, Adobe. Uh, but, but a lot of people use DaVinci too. DaVinci is really good. All right. So if if we... Can we like go that way then and knock the minion off? You can or do, just move. You want to just scoot over? That, that, you're right. That's that's easier. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the best. <laughs> All right. So let's go over this one more time. So what's going to happen in theory is the marble will come down the ramp. It'll knock over this dominoes, which will start a chain reaction with the dominoes. In theory, the knock over the minion. Dominoes will knock over the minion. Make sure we put him over right next to the edge. And when the minion falls, it will pull the string, which is attached to these beads, and then we've already seen what the inertia beads will do, and it, it sounds really plausible. 
I, I think this could work. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? Is it going to work? We're going to find out. I think that the roller coaster is the the one piece that's most likely to fail. So. <laughs> this is true. Um, yeah, our issue had been that it, like it would skip to the side. So I think we want to just All make right. sure. All right. Here we go, Math Dad. Are you nervous? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm excited. <gasps> Three, two, one. <laughs> oh, that was very satisfying. All right, I bet we could try it again 10 times and not get a better one than that. But success. Yes, that was very fun. I'm super happy that it worked. Yeah, I'm super excited to see what you guys come up with at home. Oh, I can't wait to see what you guys do with this because, you know, this was our, our quick attempt with, you know, just a, a few minutes to do it. But if you have a little more time, you can come up with something a lot longer and really awesome. And we would love to see videos or pictures. You can post them on Facebook or on Instagram and tag us. We can't wait to see what you do with a Rube Goldberg machine. And I will say, this is a great thing to do this weekend because so many of the things that make a Rube Goldberg machine work have to do with physics. And that's what we're going to be learning about next week. So super excited to see what you guys come up with. Now it's time for what's in the bag. You ready for this math, Dad? <sighs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. This what's in the bag one is pretty tricky. Oh. And <laughs> so I, I actually made a little, OK, you can't look down at the other one. You just right. got to, I'll read it to you. You look that way. All right. I am the beginning of end and the end of time and space, an essential part of element. I surround every place. Now I'll put it back over to the comments. So Math Dad, you can turn around. I actually know the answer. You know the answer? What? Have you heard this one before? You must have heard it before. I think I've heard similar riddles. Yeah, not, not this particular one, but yes, I, uh, I do know the answer. This one is so cool. When I first saw it, it sort of blew my mind because I'm be the beginning of end, the end of time and space, an essential part of element. I surround every place. So my mind immediately went to subatomic particles and I'm like, okay, what subatomic particle is going to fit this best? Would it be the quark? Would it be the boson? And I spent like a half hour trying to figure it out and couldn't land on which subatomic particle was going to be the best one. And then when I saw the answer, I was like, no way, that's genius. And here it is. The letter E. The letter E, because the letter E is the beginning of end and it's the end of time and space. <laughs> It's an essential part of element, because look at how element is spelled without it. There's no way you can tell what that says. And it surrounds every place, literally. It's like the bookends of every place. Isn't that a fantastic one? That, that, that is. That's really clever. Yeah, whoever's thinking these up is, is, is smart. Shout out to Science Moms, Liza, Krista, and Emily, because we have a big list of riddles in Trello, and they've been <laughs> searching the internet for riddles and finding them and adding them to that list. So that one was a great one. But let the record show that I got one right all on my own. <laughs> he did. He did. He got one right all on his own. <laughs> Only took me two weeks, but. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then our last, our last activity today is our Desmos activity. So we talked about Venn diagrams earlier, and we have a really cool Desmos activity that you can do. I don't know if we got the code up in advance. So I, I, I don't think so. so. But here, I'm, I'm going to turn it around because I want to. I want to take you through a couple challenges that we'd already talked about this week. Get my marker. So, one of those challenges involved fractions, and I know, the, as soon as I started getting too far into the fractions, the comments were, "Oh, that's hard." But you guys are smart, and. If you take the time and you learn this well, I promise you it will help you through all of your future math classes, working on your fraction intuition. So, so I'm going to just draw me a vertical line here going up from zero up to one. So on, on the number line, usually we draw it, the number line horizontally, I, I drew it vertically here. And there are different numbers along this. So for example, if you go, halfway between zero and one, you get the number one half, one divided by two. And what that means is you've broken it into two parts and we went up just one of those parts. So what if I gave us a fraction like 
two fifths. Where would two fifths be on this number line? Well, what we would want to do is break up the number line into five equal pieces. So maybe here, 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 here. All right, so then we got five equal pieces. So right here would be one fifth. Here we've got two fifths. Here you've got your three fifths. Here would be four fifths. And here would be five fifths. Or five divided by five is equal to one. So I'm just breaking up the number line just by counting that the, the bottom number in the fraction, this is called the denominator, it just means how many pieces you're breaking it into. And the numerator is basically how many parts we are using. So in this case, two fifths would be right here because we went up one, two parts out of five. So in today's Desmos activity, there, there's a code which maybe somebody can throw this into the chat. It was E, X, G, V, K, nine. And so if you go to student.desmos.com, student.desmos.com, so I, I've thrown in a challenge involving the, uh, of these fraction ninjas. So to, to defeat them, you've got your number line and I, I give you a fraction. So I give you a fraction like two fourths and then you have to use your samurai sword to try to cut the number line in the right location. But you, you could also take time to try to draw it out, draw out where it would be. And I, I think this is very good practice. And this is true whether you're in second or third grade all the way up through whether you're in college. If you can have a good sense for fractions, you'll be ahead of most of the rest of your class. All right, so that was one thing we learned this last week. And we also learned how to play the game of mastermind. You should tell them how many, how many ninjas did you dispatch? So I got 23, that's my highest score so far. The highest but I got was 43. So you should write, write those on the board on the corner real quick. And those are the, if you beat that, then you beat Science Mom and Math Dad. So All if right. you beat 43. So Science Mom got 23. 23. And Math Dad, I got 43. And if you get higher than that, take a screenshot. We'll share it next time. Because um, then you'll have officially beat Math Dad and Science Mom. I would be really impressed if you guys can beat my high score. I bet someone could do it. <laughs> yeah. To, if, you, if you can get uh, more, more than 10, you're doing pretty well. So, All right. So the game of mastermind. Do you remember this one, Science Mom? I do. All right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 possible rounds here. And... I'm going to, I've got a, a four digit number. Science mom is trying, going to try to guess what this number is. But the digits have to be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So there's, there's no zeros, no sevens, eights, or nines. And we, yeah, I don't know where our other colored marker is. That's all right. We've got green back here. But, oh, here we are. Okay. So I'm going to guess. Um, I always like to start off with four numbers that are the same, so then I could just rule a number out. Although maybe starting with like two and two is a better strategy. Maybe I'll try that this time. So one, one, two, two. Okay. Do we have any ones or twos? So you have. Are you going to show them the number? Oh no! I want them to play along at home. See if they okay. can actually see if you can figure it out before I do. What it is? Yeah. So in this case, you have exactly one is correct. So I'm going to use a blue dot for. Correct. Okay, so there is either one, one, or one, two, and it's in that right location. But that's right, the right number in the right location. All right, so now I'm going to do three, three, two, four. Just just for fun. It might have been easier for me if I did three, three, two, three. Okay, and the answer is none of them are right. None of them are right. But I, I, you should give me a black dot because there's a two. Oh, no. 
So that means I know there's there's one one. So I here's what here's what I can say. So one two. How many numbers are there that we're dealing with? Six, six digits are possible okay. for each place. So I know there are no twos, no threes, and no fours. That is super helpful to me. And I know I have one digit number one, and the rest are going to be five or six. And more than that, you even know the the one has to go in either the first or second location. So one five 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 is my next guess. Okay. And if I get a blue dot, then I know. Well, maybe I don't. All right. We'll find out. We'll find so out. you're going to get one blue dot, meaning it's the correct digit in the correct location. But I'm going to give you one green dot, meaning correct digit, but wrong, wrong location. location. Oh, now I know that there are two sixes. So two sixes and then a one and a five. And I just need to try and get them in the right spot. So I'm going to try one. Oh. Hmm. This is tricky. All right. I'm going to try five, one, six, six. Okay. And I'm going to give you two blue dots for the right digits in the right location. And I'm going to give you two green dots for right digit but wrong, wrong location. location. Okay. Six, one, five, six. I'm going to give you two blue dots for the right digits in the right location and two green dots for right digit but wrong location. Okay, all right. Um, five, one, six, six. No, I already did that. I already did that. I, I retract my I retract my guess. Um, ahem. Ahem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the tricky thing here is that if I've made an assumption that one of them is right and it's not right, that can that can get me in trouble. But you've got a lot of guesses left, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to get there. I do. All right. One, six, five, five. One, six, five, five. Okay. One, six, five, six is what I meant to say. <laughs> One, six, five, six. Right. Oh, okay. I'm going to give you four green dots for... Right digits, wrong, wrong location. location. Okay, help me out in the chat, you guys. What is what is the number? One six five six. That's what I just tried. Six one six five. Six one six five. Trying that. And that one is correct. Thank you, Aiden. <laughs> you saved my bacon. <laughs> <laughs> no, all of them were correct. So yeah, this is a great game, and it's it's the type of game you, you do need two pl people to play. Although in, in the Desmos activity, that, that link, yeah, you, you could play it against the, the computer, but just just the one time. But yeah, get a partner and and try this out. And at first, I think you'll probably lose more than you win. But if you, you play it enough, you'll get to the point where you win a lot more than you lose. It's a lot of fun. Now, today's, today's live stream is going to be just a little bit shorter than normal because Math Dad has some meetings that he's got to go to, but I want to make sure that we don't forget to get back to our circle art and finish that slideshow because we had such wonderful submissions. So we're going to go to the circle art, finish the slideshow. Can I mention the Venn diagram challenge? Oh, yes. Mention so, the Venn diagram challenge so real fast. I, I did have an Olympic ring Venn diagram challenge. So you, you might know what the Olympic rings look like. It's something along this line. And with, with the Olympic rings, it actually kind of creates a Venn diagram of its own here. And the challenge that I've given you in that Desmos activity is to fill in. So to just put some points in certain places. And I asked you to put in nine points so that each of the five circles has the same number of points in it. And then if you can do it with nine, then can you do it with eight points? Or can you do it with seven points? Or can you do a six, five, four, three? Like, is it even possible with these smaller numbers? Play around with it, see what you can come up with. All right, and we'll do our slideshow and then we'll answer questions. So if you have questions, Science Mom, Liza and Krista are sending to me um, on my phone and we will answer some questions. But first, I am excited to share with you the other um, the other fantastic art that we have. Whoops, that was the wrong. Oh no, it worked. That was the right window. Here we go. 
All right. So we left off with Kyle's fantastic portrait here. And then here's another singing the song. I don't know the words to this terrible song. <laughs> <laughs> terrible song. What are you talking about? <laughs> Great job, Sophie. We loved this one. We've got a portrait of bubbles. I thought that was very well done. And then look at that kind of like modern art, the way they colored it. Yeah, um, a good placement. Yeah. Donuts. Oh. Great work, Sam. Loved the donuts. A rainbow out of out of circles. Yeah. This was beautiful. Wouldn't have thought you could do a circle. Yeah. Rainbow. Wonderful job. Mickey Mouse out of circles. Ah. Water molecules out of circles. Loved these. Lollipops out of circles. I thought this one was very well done. Good job, Cora. I thought that was crab eyes. Crab eyes? Yeah, oh. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I Lollipops is what came to mind first, but that really could be like a, an animal on top of a giant crab like in um, Moana. Yeah. Yeah. And taking a dog for a walk. <laughs> nice job, Savannah. Loved this one. Circle leash. And a Venn diagram. Oh. So we've got Rubber Ducky and Bubbles. Rubber Ducky is a toy made in a factory, bought already made in the store. Bubbles are soapy-like texture made with water. Those are the things that don't overlap. But both are in the bath, and they do overlap. That's right. Nicely done. Yeah, good job anticipating the lesson today. We've got a nice rainbow. Good job, Mason. This is beautiful, and it looks to me like maybe pastels. Yeah. Really pretty colors there. That's fun. Some great animals there. <laughs> Job Ooh. Noah. Yeah, love it. And I thought this one was really cute. Fantastic energy. There's something just really great about little kid art. I love I like the energy it, there. Yeah. The Dragon Balls! <laughs> <laughs> Math Dad is so excited to see this one. He put both his arms in the air and cheered. Great. Ooh, Abby. Danny the dog, Phil the bunny, and Bella the bear. Nice work, Abby. Love this. A bubble Pikachu. Good job, oh. Natalie. I have to say, it's kind of amazing what you can do just with circles, isn't it? So here, they use circles, and then they just colored in inside the circles and made a shape that is totally not a circle. Yeah. There's a lot of possibilities. Wouldn't have thought you could do Pikachu with just circles. Yeah. And a great solar system drawing with the asteroid belt, and I love that they included the asteroid belt there beyond Mars. Yeah, Addison's another future teacher, yeah. I can tell. Ooh. Beautiful modern art style. Good job, Anch. Very nice. And that is our slideshow. So thank you again to everyone who submitted art. And I'll just remind everyone real quick again, if you would like to have your art featured in an, another show, head over to Quarantine Week 2, because our drawing prompt for this next week is to imagine life on another planet. You can share it on the Facebook page in that album. And if you do, please take a minute to give feedback and give some encouragement to the other artists who are sharing their work there. You could also share it on Instagram with hashtag Science Mom Squad. And if you don't have Facebook, don't have Instagram, you can email it to art at science.mom. But depending on our inbox, we might not see it quite as soon there as we do the other places. And now we'll have time for a few questions before we finish. So one question that I got sent was, how do, what causes headaches? What causes headaches? And this is a great question. And it's one that has several different answers. And I think that there are some headaches that we really don't understand or don't know why. So you can get a really bad headache if um, pressure in your spinal column isn't correct. And so like a spinal headache is a really severe debilitating type of headache. You can't even like get off the bed if you have a spinal headache. There are migraines. Do you know the cause of migraines? No, but whatever it is, I want to punch it. Math Dad very rarely will get a migraine. Migraines are really bad headaches as well. And then there's just sort of the typical, you know, your head kind of hurts, but it doesn't really have like a sharp point. It's just sort of a diffuse point. And I have to say, for, for spinal headaches, I understand why your head hurts and what happens. For migraines and ordinary headaches, I'm not sure. This would be a good question to research, and maybe we'll add it to the list and yeah. answer it in more detail later. Hypertension, yeah, somehow. But you actually have muscles that go over your the entire outside of your head, and yeah, like, I think sometimes it's different things that are aching in your head, but it's... Could be something different. Yeah. All right, another question. How, to, how do you make H2O at home? Can you actually make water? You can make water by reacting oxygen and hydrogen together. But that's a reaction that 
is not going to be a very safe one to do at home. And to illustrate this, I don't know if I should, should I tell this story about Ben. Um, I'm going to tell it is a like a don't ever do this story. Okay. I have a brother. My sister, all of her kids call our brother Crazy Uncle Ben. So that kind of gives you like a, a preface for this story that I'm about to tell. So Crazy Uncle Ben, my little brother, was in his condo and he was doing some electrical wiring. Um, he is not an electrician and you'll find out why pretty soon. <laughs> so he's doing a little electrical wiring in the kitchen where he had to replace like an outlet cover. And so he takes it off and he's got these two wires and then he thinks to himself, aha, I know that if you run an electrical current through water, you can, and it's high enough, you can actually make the water split apart into oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. So he sticks these two wires into a cup of water, a very bad idea that you should never do at home. And he can see that at one end, you have the oxygen gas coming up. And at the other end, you have the hydrogen gas coming up. And if he moves the wires closer together, then the bubbles increase. And if he moves them farther apart, the amount of bubbles decrease. And so he's, he's a full grown adult playing in a very dangerous, not safe way in his kitchen. And he moves the wires too close together and the hydrogen ignites and there's this big and the power goes out through the whole house. His wife was scared half to death, thought he'd electrocuted himself and he was in really, really, really big trouble. So the I, short- I think, I think it hurt quite a bit too. Yes, yes, he did get hurt. He was okay, he, he recovered. Um, and he's lucky it's not worse because it could have been a lot worse. He could have died. But um, the short answer to the question is you can make common things like water and salt but a lot of those reactions have so much energy, they're not safe at all to do at home. And making table salt is one of them. If you take chlorine gas and sodium, chlorine gas is very reactive, sodium is very reactive, and if you put those two together, they will react and form NaCl. They will form table salt. And if you look up um, videos of this on YouTube, you can find chlorine gas and sodium reacting together to form salt. The product, salt, is pretty inert, meaning it's pretty safe and not at all reactive. But those two reactants, the things that you react together, chlorine gas is poisonous, sodium explodes when you put it in water, and when you put them together, it's like a mini fireball as bright as the sun burning in a test tube and super, super energetic, something you would never want to do at home. So when you answered the, the question, like, can you make water, you actually were telling us how to get water apart. So yes. I, I, I thought you were going to point out a different danger, because so you've got hydrogen gas, Hydrogen is typically a gas, you got H2, and you got oxygen, O2, also a gas, but both of those are very flammable. And be, yeah, be, because of that. I, I will say hydrogen is flammable, oxygen is reactive, but not particularly flammable, but they're both incredibly reactive, and the hydrogen in particular. Yeah, but is super you, you, you don't want to play around with that stuff. You guys might have heard of the Hindenburg. So they, they used to have these Zeppelins, like, well, like giant air balloons, only they motor powered and they could fly around the skies and they didn't use have helium helium is much harder to get they had hydrogen well hydrogen is not hard to get and, and it's even lighter than helium so hey let's put that in the zeppelin bad idea yeah so the, the hindenburg is this famous example of, of a zeppelin that caught fire caught fire big explosions and deaths involved so yeah so blimps are no longer filled with hydrogen gas because it's too dangerous what does cyanide do to you? Cyanide is very poisonous. Um, and the exact mechanism for why it's poisonous, I don't remember. I used to know. But cyanide is a carbon and a nitrogen bonded with a triple bond. I'm almost 100% sure, certain. And I think it interferes with just the basic way that you get energy from sugar. So every single one of your cells, it, it operates by taking a sugar, breaking it down, and it makes ATP. And that kind of powers the cell. We'll get more into that in, in a couple weeks. But if you interfere with that process, then everything shuts down and you're not able to breathe. Your cells aren't able to get oxygen. And that can be real. Um, that can be a big problem. All right. Another quick question. When you put hydrogen peroxide into a cup of food coloring, why does it split into two levels? And it wasn't um, hydrogen peroxide. Well, actually, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure if they're referring to the rubbing alcohol that we did where it split into two levels because of the salt. That was salting out and it split because the water was bonded to the salt and then that made it so that it didn't bond with the rubbing alcohol. But if you put hydrogen peroxide into water, 
with food coloring. I have never seen it split into two levels. I'd have to try that and investigate it. I'm not sure. Hmm. All right. Well, let's ask one more, one more quick question. And then actually I have a little something to here. Can you answer that question? And I'm going to grab something real quick. All right. So can we make nickel or gold? So can you make those heavy metals? Uh, I mean, there are processes that can can do it. So can you make gold? Can gold be created from something else? So back in medieval times, alchemists were trying to figure out how could you make gold? And it turns out it's pretty much impossible. I think there are some reactions you can do, but it, the cost to actually bring them about is way more expensive than the gold you would get. Um, as far as making nickel, it's a good good question. So there, th th there are some some heavier elements that when they decay radioactively will decay into other elements, and it's possible that one of those heavier ones might decay into one of the other metals. But I'm off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Good question. Yeah. All right, I wanted to show you guys real fast, just in case you weren't aware. I have a series of videos called Science Mom's Guide to Water. And if you're looking for more science experiments to do this weekend, ones that are easy to do at home, um, that's one you can check out. And this little book that I have that has um, some comics you can color and also has instructions for all of the activities, I'm going to put a, an ebook copy of this on Patreon as soon as we're done. So um, for, for patrons, you can download that and then that's more activities you can do over the weekend. And then last week, we had several people message us and say, my kids, you know, we watched every day this week and then my kids woke up on Saturday and they were like, what? We don't have science mom and math dad today. So I told math dad, we should do a live stream for patrons on Saturday morning. And math dad said, they're getting tired of us, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we're cool, but we're not that cool. Nobody wants to see us on Saturday morning. Certainly no one should feel obligated to wake up early and see us on Saturday morning. But um, we are doing a patron live stream tomorrow morning same time for about a half hour or so. So that was just for patrons? Just for patrons, yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to be, I have to tell you, ever since I started the Science Mom YouTube channel, I'm doing this just because I love to teach science. And I'm trying to be a little bit better about being business-minded now that I have payroll and employees. I'm like, I should try to not operate in the red. And an important part of that is that I offer some things that are for patrons only. So um, we'll have a yeah, live stream for patrons this weekend. And I do want to give a special thank you to everyone who has joined us on Patreon because we couldn't do this without your support. And now um, they're asking for you to sing and they want they want a song that is not the song you don't know the words to. Okay, so I, I did learn a new song just, just for you guys. It goes like this. I'm singing a song, I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. It's gonna be in my head all day, all day long. Glad I could help. <laughs> it's inspired you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We've got to end a little bit earlier today on Friday because Math Dad has some meetings that he's got to go to, but um, Remember, if you if you want to watch more Math Dad and Science Mom videos, the water series takes you all the way through every single property of water and is, is a fun series that you could check out. It's on our YouTube channel. And then for, for patrons, we will see you again um, tomorrow morning. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week or, or tomorrow. Sure. Be smart, be safe.